Hi, welcome to Carousel. I'm Jerry Laird. Now I say that because of the fact, unfortunately, Jerry can't be with us here tonight, and that's the greeting that you've gotten the last 20 years with this show, meaning Carousel. Jerry has been the host for 20 years, and unfortunately, Jerry can't be with us tonight because he suffered a serious illness, and he's laid up, he is convalescing, he is getting better, and we send our thoughts and prayers to him. And so to that end, my name is Scott Albertson. I've been a guest here on Carousel a handful of times in the last three years, and by Jerry's invitation. And thank to Jerry and also our producer, Joyce Fishman, they asked me to take Jerry's place as host of Carousel while Jerry's convalescing. During the next handful of weeks, as we do future shows, we'll give you Jerry's update and how he's coming along. We're uh, doing with the idea of a new host, so to speak, being myself and working with Joyce. We've come up with some different ideas and continuing the mantra of Carousel having a wide variety of people and walks of life and what they're involved with from either business or recreation or passions, whether it be art. This is a little different tonight. I had the experience of, let's see, October 2010 of being on the ground floor, if you will, at the Maritime Aquarium here in Norwalk to be involved in the concept of having a dive team go into the open ocean tank, also known as the OT or also known as the shark tank, which is the main tank at the aquarium. And that whole concept had been on board for approximately 20 years. And they finally got it into play, got it came to fruition, and I was one of the founding members, if you will, on the team. And it's terrific. It's a wonderful experience to do that in an enclosed environment because I'm used to diving out in the ocean or along Long Island Sound. So to be in an enclosed environment in a tank that's fairly big but you're swimming around with sand tiger sharks, it's pretty interesting nonetheless. So I wanted to bring on one of the dive masters of the Maritime Aquarium and talk about what's going on there in the sense now that the program's almost two years old and also introduce folks here to scuba which is what you utilize when you're diving, whether it be in the tank at the Maritime Aquarium or on Long Island Sound or in the Pacific Ocean or wherever. So the gentleman that I asked to come on is a dive master at the Maritime Aquarium dive team, which is all volunteer, and his name is Dr. Mike Cassetta. So welcome, Dr. Mike. Oh, thanks, Thank you Scott. so much for being Good here. Good to see you. Now, this gentleman I met about a year and a half ago, because you've been with the dive team now about a year and a half, I guess. Uh, since the beginning, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's been almost, yeah, a year and a half. And he and I actually dove together the first time we met, and it was a lot of fun. But when you say a dive master, dive master is actually the person who teaches other people how to dive. It's a professional grade diver, and uh, so instructor would be the actual teacher. Dive master is an instructing assistant. Right. But it is a professional grade of diving. So what I wanted to do, I asked Dr. Mike, and by the way, Dr. Mike, he's affix, uh, affectionately known. <laughs> it really is a doctor. He's an actual MD. So we're going to refer to Dr. Mike because that's what he says every time he's diving. It's like, just call me Dr. Mike. I asked Dr. Mike to bring some of his equipment in. So some of you folks that don't know what scuba is will give you just a little bit of a hint of what the equipment is and the basics, and then we'll progress into talking about diving and talking about diving at the, MT, uh, the TMA, as it's called, the Maritime Aquarium. So this right here, which Dr. Mike has his left hand on, is the tank, which contains the air, which compressed air, and that's what, as a diver, when you're underwater, that's what you're breathing off of, so to speak. You're breathing the air out of this tank because fish breathe water and turn it into oxygen, but we can't do that. We need, what, we need oxygen to go yeah, into the in water. Yeah, in the fish, uh, the sharks uh, have very prominent gills, and with the gills, they're able to extract the necessary oxygen from the water. Uh, being land-based uh, and being mammals, we are unable to breathe underwater, so the only way we can do that is to bring our own air supply. And that's what SCUBA stands for, is a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, phrase first coined by the uh, great Jacques Cousteau. And so what we do is take basically a room full of air, and it's compressed into this tank right here. And the tank, um, I'll just spin this a little bit, just so you can see. Uh, my tank is blue, but they can come in all different colors. And this is made of aluminum, and it's very strong, and these have to be 
visually inspected as well as inspected for proper pressure grading. I've had this tank actually since 1992, so wow, these tanks can last for a very long period of time. And they also come in in steel. They come in steel as heavier, well, which is heavier and uh, can corrode a little bit quicker. Right. Um, just uh, having been diving now for 22 years, I love my compressed air, I love my <laughs> aluminum tank. Uh, there are <clears throat> many different uh, air mixtures now. You can do what's called nitrox. nitrox, which is enriched air, or some people actually do trimix, which is you know some helium in there. So those all permit you either, either to extend your bottom time or to go to deeper depths. We are limited because of the nitrogen levels in the body, how long we can stay, right. how deep we can stay. So there is some limiting physiology as well, uh, most dependent upon how much air you can bring down <laughs> with right. you. Now, um, just so folks know, I don't want to get too, too far off in this because I really want to cover a lot of ground, so sure. to speak, cover a lot of reef as we're going sure. along here. So this is compressed air, as Dr. Mike said. It's this regular old air that's just compressed down into the tank. That's so when we're diving, we can actually breathe underwater. But these tanks, and he, Dr. Mike touched on it a little bit, they have to be visually inspected once a year and also visually inspected, meaning uh, they take an actual light wand and they take this whole valve off. This is called a J-valve. And they actually drop it down into the tank with no air. Obviously, they empty the tank. And they actually look for corrosion. You were That's mentioning correct. corrosion. So every five years, you have to have these inspected. And they have to be stamped. They actually take a stamp and stamp the side Right, of it for the, the pressure date. grade. Yeah. Right. What they do is blow them up and make sure they don't give. Now, to take this pressurized air and be able to breathe it, we have right here what's called the regulator. Um, and this is what we breathe through underwater. And so um, the regulator is hooked up to the tank. The way we keep the tank on us, then, is with this vest system, and this is called a BC or buoyancy Place compensator. Right. So this helps keep the tank in place, uh, but this also uh, helps us as far as regulating our air. You can put a lot of little goodies on these uh, BCs. So what I have here is a small flashlight where underwater, if it's dark, I can put that on and I can see as well when we're in the aquarium exhibit. And I'll, I won't pull this out all the way, but I have my little <laughs> safety knife um, just in case I ever got caught up in any line. What I'll do is briefly put this on yes, so please. you can see how it works. So yes, what we please. do is we turn the air on, and then this is on a demand valve, so this will not flow unless I breathe. So to breathe, you just put it in your mouth, and you breathe in. And as long as you're underwater, that should really stay in your mouth. Um, if this comes out of your mouth, the only thing that can go in at that point is water. So no matter what, it's always a good idea to keep this in your mouth. Right, and just as an aside, if and it does happen, not often, but it does happen. And it's designed, structured that way so to do this. Sometimes if you get sick or if you get a lot of water in by mistake in your mouth, what you can do, it has a purge valve That's correct. on that regulator where you can just take it out, meaning remove it right. from your mouth, hit the, hit the in that front, and that'll release and air that'll and clear any water right. or debris that's in there. Right. And the only real key from a physiologic standpoint to diving uh, is knowing your limitations, but we always tell uh, new divers and old divers are like, you breathe continuously. You breathe at a slow rate. Uh, but the most dangerous thing you can do in diving is hold your hold breath. Your breath. Right. Uh, the other uh, cause of fatality is not knowing how much air you have. So what we do also have is, and I have a computer here, and this can gauge how much air is left in my tank. So that's something you frequently want to monitor. Typically when we're underwater, we're unable to speak. So we do signal back and forth. Most important signal being okay. If you're not okay, you give the I'm not so okay and you point to the problem. But we can also signal how much air we have left. And these tanks hold 3,000 pounds of air typically. So you can do it in 500 pound increments. Some people do a little fancy thing where they'll give like a 24. <laughs> I always get confused by that. So I still like the old fashioned. If I see somebody flashing their fist a lot, I know they have plenty of air. Yeah. But that's something we do check regularly. Now, Dr. Mike was making reference to the physiological point of not holding your breath. And not holding your breath is more important, not so much going down, but more coming up. Because what ends up happening, without getting a long explanation of it, is when you descend in the water column. Now, the water column is from the surface to the seafloor, so to speak. And anything, that water between the top and the bottom is called the water column. So when you're descending in the water column, there's pressure that's exerted all around you, and there's actually pressure in this room, which I think is, what, 28.5 PSI? I think constant, somewhere like um, It's one atmosphere. I forget exactly right. how much PSI, like but we go by atmospheres. Right. Yeah. So the point is, is that when you go down in the water column, 
there's increased pressure. And the deeper you go, the more the intense pressure is. And it's all the whole idea that you've probably seen on either Sea Hunt or maybe some old Jacques Cousteau footage where they talk about the pressure. And so the deeper you go, the, the more you get squeezed, so to speak. So the whole idea is that everything in your body as you're descending in the water column gets squeezed. All your organs, your body, the suit that you're wearing, right. all gets squeezed. So as you're coming up, as you're ascending, you want to come back up to the surface. If you're holding your breath, like if you go <gasps> like this, and let's say you're at 40 feet, and now you're ascending slowly, but you're still ascending, and you come up to like 20 feet, where your lungs were at 40 feet when you took a deep breath and because they were getting so much pressure around, now at 20 feet, it's expanding because that pressure as you come up is now is not as great as 40 feet. So you're, it's releasing. So what ends up happening is if you, like this, at 40 feet, and now you come up to 20 feet, it's not the same pressure as it was then. So then you can over expand or what they call pneumothorax. You can actually blow out a lung. You can blow out, yeah. And, uh, you know, looking at pressure, if you go up in an airplane, there's less pressure. Mm -hmm. um, on the surface in Connecticut, we're basically at sea level. That's considered one atmosphere. If you go down to 33 feet, that's two that atmospheres, concerns. and every 33 feet is an extra atmosphere. If you went way up, and that's why airplanes are pressurized, there's a drop in pressure. Right. So when we talk about thin air, that's what you're talking about. And I have... Uh, gone diving in the, in the Rocky Mountains and up in the Sierras. Wow, and which you, is like 5,000 feet. That's well, a mile even up. higher, yeah. You have yeah, to be very up. careful um, at altitude because then the pressures are different. Right. So, well, they talk about runners. Mm -hmm. When runners or athletes, professional athletes go, let's say they go to do a game in Denver, Colorado, and they talk about the difference in altitude, right. which There's is less. like around 5,000 feet, I think, in whatever mm -hmm. Denver is at that point, but it's about a mile up. And so when they go there, because of the difference in altitude, they get affected by that. Right. Because if they're used to playing in New York at sea level, you were talking about, and now all of a sudden they're a mile up, it's a whole different ball game, right. ha-ha, so to speak. So, so that's that whole... Basic dive physics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't like to too, too deep because I want to talk about Dr. Mike and how he got involved in diving and what, how he turned that passion on, so to speak. So that's the dive gear, in, in right. essence. And so let's talk about... What got you into diving? Well, as Please. a kid, uh, I grew up in Rye, and uh, we lived by the water, and I just always had a passion for the water, um, a particular love for sharks. So growing up, I really wanted to be uh, an oceanographer, uh, which didn't turn out, actually. So when I went to uh, university, I still always wanted to scuba dive, and, uh, but I was on a track professionally to become a physician, so I went pre-med anthropology and I went to the University of Notre Dame, which was landlocked, which I was a little sad about, but Lake Michigan was out there. So after I graduated, my brother, uh, who's a naval aviator, lived in San Diego. So oh, wow. I actually did my first dive. Top Gun. Yep, yeah, before I was certified <laughs> uh, out in La Jolla Cove. And when I went down and saw the Garibaldi, which are these giant uh, goldfish yeah, yeah, and the yeah, kelp, yes, yes, yes. I said, this is something I have to do. So um, shortly thereafter, I was certified. And I did my first certified dive Thanksgiving morning, 1989, oh, off wow. Beach 8th Street in Far Rockaway, New York. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and most of my dives since then have been in cold water, yeah. uh, low visibility. Um, at that time, I had just met my wife, and she's also uh, a dive master, so we okay. um, spent a lot of time diving together. So even though we have done some warm water dives, wherever I've been, I've, I've been diving locally. So Now, I want to ins just insert something here about folks talk about diving Long Island Sound, for example, in this area. And their immediate, and you, I'm sure you've had a lot of experience sure. as, as well. Their immediate response is like, mm. and because, first of all, it's mud-based out here. And secondly, it's not, the visibility is a lot less, certainly if you were to go down to the Caribbean or down to Florida or out in the South Seas or something like that. But it's astounding. And the maritime, to connect it, the, MT, the uh, TMA, the Maritime Aquarium, is a solid, specific, unique example of that, meaning there's so much life out here that people don't realize, meaning Long Island Sound. Oh, Long, Long Island Sound, um, and I've grown up on the Sound, and right. we had a small boat in Rye since I was a kid, and I used to go snorkeling, and uh, particularly in the rock coves, there's lots of life. There's small Absolutely. lobsters, you, you see tautogs all the time. So when people ask me, how's the Sound? I always say, it's wonderful, and most importantly, in an area with 20 million people, I can go down the water and not see anybody for an hour and have a great time. Exactly. So if you want some solace, it's absolutely wonderful. And, uh, you know, in the 22 years I've been diving, I've done close to 1,500 dives, a vast majority 
uh, in cold water, um, a strong percentage actually in what's considered low visibility. And uh, I love it. Um, oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's you. just a passion. Yeah. And I actually feel unnerved when I go in the warm water. I'm not wearing my regular gear, and the visibility is so good, I don't even know what to look at. We're in the sound. If you see something interesting, and there are a lot of interesting uh, things in the sound, oh, it's there. And then further up the northeast, where, and that's what the ocean open tank represents, is the area where the sound turns into the ocean and off Jamestown, Rhode Island oh, is a very Island, nice yes. uh, shore dive. Actually, I'm going out there this Saturday, so I'm looking forward to that. Okay, good but there's plenty of life there. And in the summer, when the Gulf Stream comes up, you see a lot of tropical fish come in the area. There's also, referring back to the sound, because I dive out in the sound. I started in 1980. I started diving and I shoot underwater, underwater photography as well. And going out into the sound, there are and you tell people about this and they go, wow, they, 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 it just doesn't register with them that, that this is possible. But there's seahorses out in the sound. There's uh, critters called sea spiders, mm -hmm. which get about maybe yay big around. And they're very frail looking creatures. And there's uh, all kinds of crabs. You're talking about lobsters. There's halibut. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Sure. <laughs> and there's a place over in north, north side of Long Island that I call Crane's Neck. And I got Jim Paul involved in this. Now, Jim Paul is the head of the dive program, the volunteer dive program at the Maritime Aquarium. And I talked this up, and he's like, yeah, let's go. But there's a place over on the north side of the island called Crane's Neck. Now, to find it, you can actually find it on a map. But the dead reckoning to find it just by visual cues is there a, it's a gigantic boulder. The god dang thing is about the size of a, of a VW Bug. And it's got a huge green, bright green shamrock on it. You can't miss it. It faces the sound. You can't miss it when you get close to the, to the shoreline. But Crane's Neck, at this time of year, right now, it's a little late, but latter part of May, depending on water salinity and depending on temperature and all that. Now, we they had a very mild winter, so it probably started a little earlier this season. But there are critters called oyster toadfish that we actually have at the Maritime Aquarium. Oh, yeah, they're really neat to see. And oyster toadfish... For lack of better description, their face kind of looks like Louis G. or Edward G. Robinson. It's very wide, the the lips. big <laughs> lips, yeah, and they got all this funky <laughs> stuff hanging yeah. off of them. Not that Edward G. has all this funky stuff hanging off of them, but they, they look like Edward G. Robinson with the big lips and the big broad face, and they got these big bulgy eyes. But they're so hip because they literally, because they're called oyster toadfish, croak underwater. Yeah. They actually make this, <laughs> and it's specifically when they're mating is when they're most active. And they literally, if you get into a bed, and Crane's Neck is famous for this, there's a bed where they actually uh, breed yeah. because they're bottom dwellers, and it's really astounding. Okay, so let's go to a video clip that sure. we have of you at the Maritime Aquarium, and let's go to it right now, please. Forty-four degrees today. Very comfortable for this exhibit. Oh, I don't know if you guys saw the uh, little hell of it. Sometimes a little slow, but then they kind of like my thumb as well. So one thought my thumb looked quite tasty. <laughs> it didn't want to give it to my. The wolf fish were very friendly today, and they were coming up and begging. So even though Randy's feeding them, I did give him a couple of pieces. B, our big halibut, ate wonderfully today. And so now I'm exiting. I'm in a semi-dry. Randy's in a dry suit today. And I was in there 
25 minutes, 44 degrees, perfectly comfortable. Lobster claw gloves are a must. Yeah. Oh, they ate well though. V took all of hers. And she didn't want to drop more after that. That was footage taken at the Maritime Aquarium at TMA. And there's a phrase that we used to use when I used to dive out in the Pacific. We used to go, no bubbles, no troubles. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that, that footage there was one of two different dive opportunities we have. So um, as a group of volunteers, which you and I were at the beginning, we dive in the open ocean right. tank, which has eight sand tigers, and now we have a lemon shark and two stingrays. The other opportunity is, um, as you saw in there, we have a very large halibut and some smaller uh, halibut. And one of the problem in the Go Fish exhibit is the salmon and cod are very aggressive and we're stealing the food. So since as volunteers we were there, the aquarist asked if we wouldn't mind going into the water. And being one of the guys who doesn't mind diving in cold water, that exhibit is very cold. It's, cold. it's about yeah, 40 it's degrees. Yeah. And I'm probably the only silly person going in in a <laughs> wetsuit. Everybody else uses a dry suit. Uh, so what we're trying to do there is target feed. Uh, and the large halibut there, B, is about six feet. Wow. Um, and I've grown very accustomed. B looks out for me when the salmon and cod get aggressive, oh. so I won't eat halibut anymore just because, <laughs> because she's my that, friend. Yeah. One of the other fun things for me there, and we'll talk a little bit about the open ocean tank too, uh, my daughter was there in the video with me, and one of the big joys I've had as a volunteer down there is being able to share my passion with my kids, because yeah. they do uh, come sometimes and watch me, and when we're in the open ocean tank, we're on a full face mask speaking to the crowd, and the fact that my kids can see me underwater and ask questions. Last year, one of my daughter's uh, brownie troops came down, so oh, I'm still considered a hero because, that's so you know, neat. they're like, your father was in with all those sharks. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to get this in before we run out of time because we are getting close to it. Is, are they still doing Thursdays? And yeah. Saturdays and Sundays, is that what the schedule is now? Yeah, we, and once again, we're all volunteers, and typically what we do is we dive three times a week on Thursdays, Saturdays, Saturdays and, and Sundays, Sundays right. and we're in the open ocean tank, and right. we typically will put uh, two divers in at a time. Sometimes at Christmas, um, St. Nick will take a little break, so yep. Santa will come down He'll and join in. us. Yep. Uh, but the dives typically are at 11.45 and 1.45. Right. Um, we do sometimes not have enough volunteers to pull it off if somebody doesn't feel well. And we need at least four people. We need somebody out front to right. handle the crowd, somebody up top to help with the communications, and at least two divers. And when you're diving, you always have a buddy. When you're on the face mask, uh, you're, you're, have, you're watching the crowd, so you're not looking out. We do have some of the teeth here from the sharks from the, from sharks, the exhibit. Yeah. And I don't know how well uh, hard to these, see. these turn out. But um, the sand tigers do have fairly sharp teeth, yes. and so we need the safety diver to look out for us. Now, I want to just insert this as well. When Dr. Mike's talking about four or five people to have to do the dive or dives in on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, and Sunday, is the place where we meet the crowd, so to speak, or where the public comes through is the general viewing area for the ocean open tank, the OOT. And that's where the public comes and they can look in and see what's going on. Where we enter the tank is actually up a floor above and in a separate room. So meaning he, Dr. Mike was referring to other people to get into the water. So what you see as a general public looking into the tank and you see the divers come in is not exactly what's going on, meaning there's a whole other floor where we're up and then we actually go into the tank from there and there's dive platforms that go into the tank and we get on the dive platforms, put the rest of our gear on, get in the water and then we reverse course and we come back up. Yeah, so and, and ideally the communications work. Yes. Um, it is a sophisticated uh, system, so unfortunately some days we can't talk to the crowd, but like at the beginning we actually didn't and Scott sometimes when I was in uh, before we had the face mask, would write on a dry board, and you know, one of the questions the first dive we did was, "Are you hungry?" <laughs> and it was it was less. I said, "Yeah, I'm starving." Um, you know, because we had had a long morning, and uh, it, it's a lot of work, but it is um, really just been a, a great experience. Oh, it's been so much and fun. And as a, combining a hobby with uh, my passion for sharks, and the and the volunteer team we have is just amazing. It is. Um, and the other good thing is. As a physician, I'm on call frequently, and I can't leave the area and go dive exotic places, but since I'm not too there. far away, and I'm on call, if I'm at the aquarium, I'm not far from where I need to be in case I had sure. to go to work. So frequently, I, I will volunteer on the weekends where I'm also on call. 
it's it is the passion, no question about it. It's also the knowledge, and Dr. Might alluded to that, meaning the volunteer dive program that they have and the volunteer program that they have where you go and you see folks with the green shirts, like a Kelly green shirt, if you will, and that are standing at different exhibits and they talk about what you're looking at and what you're experiencing and they give information. Those both volunteer programs have such a tremendous wealth of knowledge and experience of all different kinds of people that come and bring not only their passion, their interest, and their, their intellect, and it's, it's, I get a little tongue-tied about it because I'm as passionate about it as you right. are. And it's beautiful to be there. And that is an integral part of what makes the TMA, the Maritime Aquarium, right. function is yeah. by having those volunteer programs and having those yeah. people come in. And certainly the paid staff, no question, keep it going. But the integral part uh, is really the volunteer program. Yeah, and I'll just tell both. you. Yeah, the quick story was before the first dive, um, you know, and we hadn't really been in with the sharks yet. So the day before, my partners were asking me, well, is this safe? I said, well, I think so. <laughs> and, and my wife asked me the same thing the, the night before. And as I was driving down for the first day of diving, my mom called and said, do you know what you're doing? Is this safe? You know, the <laughs> yeah, other exactly. time. And she set my dad up, which, uh, you know, he was there for the first dive and you, uh, you met my dad. So that was funny. Even being, you know, in your upper 40s with three kids and a professional, know. you know, my Italian mom still looking out. Once a sure mom, he, always yeah. a mom. That's right. Always looking out for <laughs> yeah, the bambino. Absolutely. Yes, yep. exactly. All right. So we're kind of winding down here in the interview. So first of all, thank you oh, for coming. Pleasure. And it's always a joy to be with you when we're at the TMA or certainly for coming on here and bringing your equipment and sharing with people and getting a little bit of information about scuba. Because not a lot of people know about scuba. And certainly... Not a lot of people know that this dive program now, which is coming to almost their second anniversary, exists at the Maritime Aquarium. So thank you for coming in. My pleasure. I appreciate it, Mike, and hopefully no we'll come sweat. back again. And yeah. we can talk a little bit more about not only the equipment, we can talk about diving and about what you've seen and experienced. And we're going to close out the show here tonight, as we did with another show previously, for Jerry Laird, who was the host here of Carousel for 20 years. And most people didn't know that he had a singing career as well and he's released about six or seven CDs so for Jerry we send our love and our hope that he gets better real soon and we're gonna close out tonight's show with a song from one of his CDs so thank you for being here with us thank you Dr. Mike go to the Maritime Aquarium it's North Water Street in South Norwalk here in Norwalk Connecticut thank you very much enjoy your summer So you met someone who set you back on your heels, goody, goody. So you met someone and now you know how it feels, goody, goody. So you gave him your heart too, just as I gave mine to you. And he broke it in little pieces, now how do you do? So you lie awake just singing the blues all night. So you think that love's a barrel of dynamite Hooray and hallelujah You had it coming to you Goody, goody for 